I'd like to give a big shout out to all my patrons, my Wildlings Night's Watch, and my high tier patrons, my Kingsguard, which feature Brendan, Sarah, Pat, Nick, Oscar, Stuart, Josephine, Ikaika, Amanda, RJ, Shad, Nicoletta, Ezra, Jennifer, and Jeffrey. Thank you all so much. You're the best. Welcome back to the Fancy Network, everyone. My name is, of course, Jimmy Nuts, and today we're going to be talking about The Darkness That Comes Before by R. Scott Baker, which is book one in the Prince of Nothing trilogy. This is probably the most recommended book to me when it comes to liking Grimdark. When I say that I enjoy Grimdark, there's always a comment saying, you need to read this book. And I can totally see why now. And it was, I'd say, a little bit surprising with how much I actually ended up enjoying it. You never know what you're going to get when someone recommends something because of how grim it is. But I think this is actually just an amazing book. And I think that R. Scott Baker is a really, really talented writer. And for all of the recommendations that I've actually got for The Darkness That Comes Before by R. Scott Baker, I didn't really have much of an idea what it was about. But it turns out it's much about, especially here book one, setting up what is to be a holy war. It's a world scarred by an apocalyptic past, evoking a time both 2,000 years past and 2,000 years into the future, as untold thousands gather for a crusade. Traveling among them, two men, two women, are ensnared by a mysterious traveler. Anna Sarumbor Kellis, part warrior, part philosopher, part sorceress, charismatic presence from lands long thought dead. The darkness that comes before is a history of this great holy war, and like all histories, the survivors write its conclusion. And that is a bit uh, ambiguous, I would say. I think it gives like a pretty light premise, but it really is that, especially book one. It's the setting up of what seems to be a holy war, and that there's an apocalypse way in the past that a lot of people don't know the history of. It feels like so many subtle things are hinted at in the prologue that you're going to be able to figure out later that are going to be really important, and you kind of get dropped into the deep end. I think it's a little bit similar to Malazan in that regard, but way more easier to settle into the events with way less a cast of characters, and I think that this narrative is a little bit more personal. And I spoke of, you know, the general premise being about an apocalypse that happened thousands of years ago that's kind of shrouded in a lot of mystery, and people don't know the super, you know, evident truth of what happened then. Uh, but there was plague, there was fires, there was dragons. And I think that it's very clear the message from the prologue is that history is important, and if you don't know the history, you can't protect yourself from it in the future. And with a name like Second Apocalypse, which is what the overarching you know series is called here for R. Scott Baker, this book seems like we're trending towards a holy war and maybe another apocalyptic event. And with the end of the world happening, we see humans falling into their vices and becoming the worst versions of themselves. And quickly, I can see through the prologue that this is more one of the darker fantasies that I've read. And I'm going to try my best not to continue to compare it to Malazan, but because I'm reading Malazan right now, uh, I did get major Erickson vibes in, in a more personal fashion, though, and I think in a more digestible way of the whole show Do Not Tell. And I think it's actually done really well here. For everything that's talked about with this series, I'm kind of surprised that people don't talk how just about how excellent R. Scott Baker's writing is because his prose is magnificent and I actually just really like the way that he tells his story. And the world is vast. It's very fantastical and very epic. Uh, there are multiple races, which you know if you've been watching this channel that I'm really into that. Uh, I think it's something that more fantasy should lean in towards because we give the freedom uh, to explore a lot more themes that way and you get to build these cultures out and I just think it's really cool. Uh, there's non-men in here, which I believe are the elves so you know I'm down with that. And there's a massive amount of languages and dialects, and I think it just adds a very robustness feel to the world, really rounded out and very, uh, you know, tangible. And I really like that. I will say the names in this story are among some of the hardest I've ever had to pronounce uh, when reading fantasy, uh, to the point where I was giving some characters nicknames in my head so I wouldn't have to read the whole world and, like, fumble it every time because it was tripping me up when I was reading. Um, I'll probably mispronounce them here in the video as well. Uh, but that's one thing just to kind of note that there are some very, very difficult names to pronounce here. And there's also a lot of beliefs and religions to keep track of as well, especially with all the plotting and the scheming that's going to be going on. And then there's even different schools of magic. So, I, as you can see, this is an epic fantasy. Yes, it is grimdark. Yes, it is uh, bleak, but it's also just what we love, which is epic fantasy. I had to leverage the glossary quite a bit while I read this first book. And R. Scott Baker has some very awesome characters. Kellis, which is, I believe he's like, he's younger. He's like in his 30s, I believe, maybe 33, 34. And he is a monk that we're introduced to as our first real POV, and he's searching for his dad. His discipline from his childhood seems to have made him very, very good at reading and manipulating people and getting them to do what he wants to do. 
And he also just happens to be a bit of a sociopath. <laughs> um, and it seems like he's on this journey to find his dad and that he believes that the history of the apocalypse that happened has been shrouded from his people and that they don't know the truth. And the apocalypse did happen thousands of years ago, so a lot of people, uh, his people, treat it as a superstition rather than a fact, and this does not sit well with Kellis. And his powers do make him a very menacing figure. I think of other Chosen Ones and other... And, and I'm calling him a chosen one, maybe that's not the right way to go, but he does seem like the most powerful person uh, because of his abilities. It reminds me a little bit of Paul from Dune in a lot of ways, and I think that that actually might have even been an influence here, if I remember that correctly. I believe I read that somewhere, maybe. Uh, but it's, it's amazing that he has all this power, and because he's a sociopath, he has absolutely no emotion to control him. Uh, and what is going to happen with a figure like that in a world so torn? Another POV that we get here is Akamean. Uh, I believe that's how it's pronounced. I'm going to say that that way the rest of this review. But Akamean is a middle-of-the-road employee. He's like in his 40s, middle of life, and he's a sorcerer and a spy. Pretty good at his job, but he's just burnt out, and he's disgruntled. And I think a lot of people can connect with Akamean in that regard. Uh, there's th things that we do in life, and we will do them for the rest of our lives. And we find ourselves just kind of tired of it all. And I think that is where Akamean is, and it just makes him so relatable, and he's one of my favorite characters in the story. Also among the cast, we have Nair, who is kind of a barbarian type. If you have read A Song of Ice Fire, very similar to the Dothraki. However, it's interesting because he his, he's the leader of a tribe, and he does amazing things, and he's a warrior, but he's also super insecure. And his unsureness of how his tribes perceives him uh, is a really interesting take on this kind of archetype of character, and I really, really like it, because you can tell that these people are brutal. But Nayer seems to be very intellectual, and I wonder if some of his psychotic tendencies come from the fact that he's in the struggle of what he should be to his people in image and who he really is in himself. He's a very interesting character. Another POV, and yes, there are a lot of POVs, is S Minit, uh, who is a prostitute that has connections to our other POV of Akamean, and I think she could be my favorite character out of the entire cast. I think she's just such a complex character that R. Scott Baker really takes a lot of time to divulge into the details of her self-loathing and where she finds herself in this world and in this conflict. There's a scene for S. Minute uh, about halfway through the book that is really tough to get through, to be honest with you. I felt every single word of every single sentence there, and it does provide some of the most raw emotional reactions that I had to this book but I think that she might be my favorite character. And there are some other POVs, and I'm probably going to mention them as I start like recapping now like what I thought of the plot and of the book overall. Uh, but I want to say, if you like political maneuvering before war times, this is the book for you. Book one of this is largely about setting up the battle that is to come. So it's almost all maneuvering, all world building, uh, but there's still a lot of really good moments, and there is some action as well. Not like I'm, I'm dead serious when I say the scheming, the spying, the political maneuvering is as thick as it can get <laughs> in fantasy, but I also feel like it's some of the most well-written, maybe the best written maneuvering and scheming and spying that I've ever read, but you might have to take some notes because it is a bit dense. And to the fantasy element of the story, the magic is super powerful, and I feel like it is a underlying aspect of here that the show that like magic is power and how it is uh, manipulated and who holds the most power out of them all uh, will likely have the upper hand in this war. So controlling that power is very, very big. And after part one, it was very evident to me that Baker is just a tremendous writer, but also pays attention to the very fine details. And when he uses a POV, he uses it to its maximum potential. None of these feel like throwaways or hollow or anything like that. Uh, they do go through some tough stuff, but they're also growing as you follow them. And it's moving the plot together uh, and forward albeit slowly, but I think at a very good pace. Also, the Senthes are wild. They're like these little crows that exist in the world, but they have little bald human heads, so that's disturbing. Emperor Xerius is a, another POV that comes later into the story. I believe it's like right at the beginning of part two, and I wasn't really sure how to feel about him, but like all of the court stuff around him, though, awesome. I really enjoyed it. Confus is his very, very ambitious nephew, uh, and also the clear heir to the throne, so you can imagine there's a little bit of tension there. And then his grandmother, uh, which is the king's mom, is very, very mischievous. And this is where a lot of the major intrigue really comes in, and I mean, the grandmother is, uh, man, she's a sick lady, honestly, there's no other way to put it. 
uh, some pretty disturbing stuff and she's extremely devious. The combat in this book is also very well done. I don't think it's super low level and gritty like a Bernard Cornwell or a John Gwen, but I really thought that it was appeasing to me because the sensory, uh, it was just like sensory overload. The imagery is very good. And if you're someone who's really into magic and you wish that, you know, there were a little bit more OP sorcerers <laughs> in fantasy, this one could be for you. Uh, they can float like tree tall and, and it is just devastating power that they possess. And it was right around the end of part three where this book really got me and it's where I feel really confident to recommend this book to a lot of people. Uh, just some moments that I didn't see coming and when they happened, I was just so enthralled by them. Um, the political maneuvering and all the scheming and whatnot gets you in a position where you're a little bit vulnerable to a surprise and then the dark stuff or the real big epic stuff just punches you in the face and Baker's very good at playing with your emotions like that and kind of diverting your attention away and then smacking you with something uh, you know aside the head. And then you got your POVs that you're getting introduced to, you kind of get them ironed out in your head, and then they start intersecting, which is always like the fa my favorite part of a book one in fantasy, right? Uh, but seeing anyone interact with Kellis, uh, who is the sociopathic monk, is some of the most interesting, compelling stuff that you will see on a page. Uh, what a character this is. Like I said, I felt like it's kind of a commentary on Paul from Dune, uh, but done just so well. And knowing that he has no emotions and how he's playing these people and how he's able to manipulate them. Uh, you see these POVs and you're hoping they don't get tricked or they don't get used, uh, but they generally do. <laughs> And it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, the grimness and, and some of the darker aspects of this book. I do not think that this would be a book for someone who uh, does not like reading about abuse, uh, especially of the sexual nature. Um, there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of mature things going on in this book, clearly, because it is grim and dark and it is Prince of Nothing. Um, but I know that not everyone that watches this channel reads Grim Dark, uh, and maybe you're considering dipping your toe into it because it sounds interesting. Um, that's just something, like, if you're not really big into reading about that kind of thing, uh, it does take place here, and it does happen, uh, so you might want to be on the lookout for that. And it is very bleak, and it is very dark. So I think all the grimness that's kind of hyped up about this trilogy, um, so far at least in book one, and the darkness that comes before, I think that it's uh, valid, and I think it's warranted that it is uh, one of the darker fantasies that I've read. And I adored the ending of this book, and I have not really stopped thinking about this book. I have actually forgotten a good amount of details, which to note, by the way, uh, each book actually has a recap at the beginning, which is amazing because I'm in the middle of some stuff right now, and I'm not, I haven't been able to get to book two, but as I'm reviewing this, I really want to go jump into book two. <laughs> um, but there's a recap at the beginning of each book, so if you don't feel like you're going to be able to read it all the way through, so you want to wait, you could read book one and then come back to book two later because of the recap in book two for book one. I think that's like something more authors should do, to be honest, like the story thus far. Uh, that's something R. Scott Baker did do for this series, which is very welcomed. Uh, but yeah, the ending of this book was so, so excellent. Uh, it's very reminiscent to me, and maybe people would agree or disagree with me, to the Council of Elrond. It kind of felt like R. Scott Baker's Council of Elrond, because all of this stuff's finally coming together. The plans are going in place, and now we are about to see a war waged like none before it. Uh, this could be an apocalyptic event, and I'm so excited <laughs> that I'm going to get to watch all of these schemes play out, but also the war happen. Because like I said, there's some really powerful magic, some really powerful warriors in this, and I think the combat that I got so far, love it through Nayer's POV, uh, was excellent. Like I said, the sensory details were abundant, and the imagery was excellent. So knowing that book two and three, like the temperature's about to get turned up quite a bit, and I have a feeling that we're going to see way darker stuff happening in books two and three, uh, I'm nervous, but I'm also really excited. And the coming together of all the POVs and all of the planning in this little Council of Elrond that R. Scott Baker did was one, a nice nod, in my opinion, to classical fantasy, but in this really, really dark world. And it just rocked. I just loved it. Uh, this was very metal. <laughs> this is heavy metal fantasy, but not in the sense of like where things are cheap. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like a lot of times whenever people talk about grimdark or they talk about like a heavy metal fantasy or something like that, or they say dark fantasy, it comes across that people are just trying to get you to go, Ugh, and ah. but no, like Baker is such a talented writer. Like if you could get anything out of this review, I want you to walk away knowing that R. Scott Baker's super duper talented. I just actually finished The Lines of Alversan by uh, Guy Gavriel Kay, and it was a very um, good book. I really enjoyed it. And I kept thinking the whole time that the way the history was laid out in that book was very similar to this because it is a history being written. So the victors are writing it 
and the way it's related to you, it just feels like it really happens. And I felt the same way about Guy Gabriel Kay's book. So in some ways, R. Scott Baker reminds me a lot of Stephen Erickson, but he also reminds me a little bit of Guy Gabriel Kay, and I do think his writing is beautiful. I think it's very well written, and even the darkest points of this story come across the page very well because of how talented that he is as an author. I hope I did a good job of maybe explaining a little bit more about this. This is a book that I don't see talked about a lot in the Prince of Nothing trilogy as a whole. I don't see a ton of conversation about it on book two. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong places. Uh, I know Slowly Red's a big fan of it, and I love, you know, I love seeing his takes on a lot of books. I think he's like the king of Grimdark here on booktube. Uh, and I happen to enjoy Grimdark as well, as long as it's really well done. And I think that R. Scott Baker is doing a good job of it. I don't think it's for everybody for sure, but I think it's probably for more people than it would seem. Uh, so maybe you'd like to give it a shot. I definitely recommend it. I really love this book, and I'm going to be reading book two as soon as possible, especially after going over my notes and going through this review. I'm a little bit more hyped up uh, than I was, you know, last week to get back to book two because I forgot about a lot of the good stuff that happens here. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, that is down in the description, optional but always appreciated. If you like this video, go ahead and hit like and think about subscribing possibly to see more videos like it. I'll be covering more Grim Dark Fantasy, more R. Scott Baker, and just a bunch of other stuff in general. We have Chatting with Nuts podcast on here, which is always a good time. I appreciate you taking your time to check out this review today, and I hope you're good. I hope you're safe. Until next time, remember to always... Keep turning the page.